Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Stephen Tizer of Princeton University. Professor Tizer hardly needs an introduction, and uh, the size of this room tells us uh, that. But uh, um, I will not, nonetheless say something about his wonderful work. Uh, Professor Taisa is D.T. Suzuki Professor in Buddhist Studies and Professor of Religion in the Department of Religion at Princeton University. He's very well known for his approach to Buddhism, uh, which has paid uh, uh, attention to interactions and intersections. Interactions between Buddhism in India, China, Korea and Japan. Interactions uh, of Buddhism with other religious traditions of uh, China. First of all, Taoist interaction between expressions of Buddhism in the elite context and in the popular context. His methodology makes use of a wide ranging of sources, doctrinal sources, historical documents, as well as artistic and material sources. And his insights um, theoretically draw on history, anthropology, literary theory, and religious studies. Um, the worth of this scholarship is very well illustrated by his uh, uh, three monographs to date, uh, all awarded major prizes. Um, the first one, the Ghost Festival in Medieval China, was awarded a prize in history of religion by the American Council of Learned Society and looked at uh, the, the meaning of uh, uh, this very important festival in, uh, um, in uh, medieval China and uh, the influences that uh, uh, Buddhist patterns had on Taoist practice. His second book, The Scripture on the Ten Kings and the Making of Purgatory in Medieval Chinese Buddhism, uh, also awarded uh, um, the Joseph Levinson Book Prize in Chinese Studies. Um, and the third monograph, um, Reinventing the Wheel, Paintings of Rebirth in Medieval Buddhist Temples, that won the uh, Stanislaw Julian Prize uh, uh, of the uh, Académie des Inscriptions and Belles of the Institute of France. Um, both uh, look at, um, um, again, a very important uh, uh, representation in uh, documents and in uh, um, artistic productions of uh, the hell and the purgatory and uh, the question of rebirth. Um, Professor Tyson has also co-edited two very important books for uh, students, uh, books that we always use in class, so I think we should also mention those. Um, readings on the Lotus Sutras and readings on the Platform Sutra that introduce these fundamental scriptures uh, uh, for the East Asian context uh, to a broader audience. His current research project, Curing with Karma, that's the title, is what he's uh, going to talk to us uh, uh, tonight, examine, examines uh, healing liturgies, um, particularly in documents uh, from Don Juan, um, that um, express the interaction between Buddhism and indigenous Chinese tradition, excuse me, Chinese tradition, and the wealth of uh, um, sutric and non-canonical text unearthed on the Silk Road. So without further ado, please join me to welcome Professor Taisa Tosoas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucia. I send my thanks, express my thanks to Professor Dolce, uh, Chair of the Center of Buddhist Studies, and to the other members of the Buddhist Studies Committee, uh, Professor Palumbo, Professor Luxanitz, and Professor Pagel. I also uh, want to take this opportunity because a representative uh, COO of the foundation is herself here uh, to thank the Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation uh, for sponsoring this series, as well as for their work in sponsoring Buddhist studies broadly, uh, in sponsoring projects on art, and on sponsoring projects on the Hong Kong. So thank, thank, thanks to all of you for very, very much. Uh, for about 2,000 years, <clears throat> people from all walks of life in China took recourse to different therapies when they fell sick. Depending on individual fortune and the 
possibility of local care facilities. They might seek help from a doctor practicing acupuncture, moxibustion, or prescribing herbal cures. They might go to an exorcist, a Taoist priest, or a Buddhist monk. Sometimes they went to all four such practitioners in succession. My lecture today is an attempt to survey the range of healing methods offered by Buddhist monks in particular between roughly the 4th and 10th centuries. Hence, my subject today draws more narrowly from my current research on liturgies for healing contained in the Dunhuang manuscripts. But I'd like to place that evidence, especially in today's lecture, in a broader context, so I want to range more broadly than simply materials from Dunhuang. I'd like to draw on evidence from paintings, sutras, talismans, manuscripts, including liturgies, and other archaeological remains, and explore the technologies that are employed in Buddhist forms of healing. The techniques ranged from relatively humble acts of donation to more extensive projects involving copying of scriptures, chanting spells, and confessing one's faults to more complicated ones, such as commissioning the making of images, sponsoring a lamp lighting ceremony, making seals or ingesting talismans, or engaging the services of an exorcist. My lecture highlights the logics of these various practices and in the end, in the conclusion, reflects on the process of healing in Chinese Buddhism. As you can see, my lecture is divided into four parts. I want to address, firstly, how we think about sickness and curing. Secondly, I want to look at what I categorize as relatively simple acts of healing, giving, copying, chanting, and confessing. Then look at forms of healing that are slightly more involved. They involve more people. They involve greater resources. Uh, they involve more specialized technologies, such as lighting of lamps, sealing, and ingesting talismans and exorcism. Finally, I'll reflect on what this says about the broader process of healing as reflected in Chinese Buddhism. So uh, I think it's good at the beginning of a talk about healing uh, to think about how we conceive of healing and how the different realms of uh, what we might consider to be sickness, uh, good health, salvation, medical science, uh, herbal practice, religious healing, and so forth, how they all fit together. My very basic point, uh, I, I, I hope most of you will agree with from the very start, is that sickness and wellness and the different techniques of healing have been conceived and organized as spheres or as overlapping areas of practice rather differently in different times and places. I'm taking basically a historical approach to healing. So if I were in England, uh, I would first try and make sense of how the system for providing health services works here. And I would be confronted, uh, first of all, with a, num a number of acronyms which are completely new to me. And if I looked at the history of them, I'd find that they change every couple years as well. <laughs> I, I would have to understand what the cl a clinical commissioning group is, uh, what a GP is. I'd have to understand where to go or what is actually considered a secondary care service, such as planned hospitalization, rehabilitation, et cetera. And I can assure you that the, the system in the country where I come from is far more complicated, less well organized, and, and more poorly funded. If we were going to jump from the modern Western world to a traditional Buddhist viewpoint, how would we think about sickness in that context? We might use the analysis of the four truths, and, and in particular, the first of the four noble truths, to come up with a Buddhist way, a uh, potentially Buddhist way of, of thinking about well, wellness and healing. As you, as you all know, the Four Noble Truths, I don't need to run through them at length here, uh, suffering, the arising, the, its cessation, and the path to the cessation are all well known. So 
also well known are an analysis of different forms of suffering, uh, many in uh, both Indian, uh, in both Indic and uh, East Asian sources uh, talk about either four or eight forms of suffering. Uh, the first four uh, well known throughout the Buddhist world, Sheng Lao Bing Si, uh, the suffering of birth, suffering of old age, suffering of sickness, and the suffering of death. All of these things are unpleasant and involve suffering. Uh, there are essentially added to that emotional and mental forms of distress caused by separation from that which we love, association with that which we hate, the inability to fulfill our sim even our simplest of desires, and all forms of suffering that are due to our endowment with the five skandhas, the continuum of mental and bodily elements. If that's a relatively widespread Buddhist conception, Let's look at some, at some conceptions from specifically medieval China. And I'd like to use uh, an example here uh, from an early 6th century statesman, uh, Guo Zhu Shen, uh, because it encapsulates uh, what I think is a long-time attitude in China and in many cultures towards multiple therapeutic techniques. Uh, Guo himself uh, was not a medical practitioner, nor was he a very religious person. He was a fairly straight Confucian official. And in the piece of writing I'm quoting here, he's actually, his main subject is not healing at all. His main subject is, is, is the traditional Confucian subject of giving advice to a ruler and encouraging the ruler, uh, his emperor, to select wise officials and wise counselors. So to make his point that that's not a point about medicine, but rather a point about governing, he uses contemporary medical practice in order to instruct the emperor. What does he say? He says, when people are sick, they, they do four different things. They go to Taoist priests, who specialize in the sending of a written memorial and petition to the gods, or they go to Buddhist monks and nuns who call for feasts and sutra lectures, sutra chanting, or they go to profane masters, exorcists who insist on release from demonic catastrophe, or people go to doctors and acupuncturists who administer soup and prescribe medicine, all of them claiming to be the most capable. Of course, many of these are tried in succession without any firm distinction between them except for the people doing the practice, the technology involved, and most important, the results obtained. Some of the implications then uh, to draw this discussion of the, the broader conceptualization of, of sickness to a close uh, sickness and wellness are relative to each other. That is, even if one can escape sickness, at one point one is still subject to suffering. Sickness and wellness follow each other over many lifetimes. In addition, even when we do achieve good health in this lifetime, that state of good health is not final. Sickness then becomes the point of departure for talking about something that is more final, and that is some kind of final liberation. So sickness is a point of departure for initiating or, or talking about a, a more a continuing process that will eventuate in something ultimate. I'll show you examples of that in my talk. Buddhist healing, furthermore, is not an exclusive practice. Neither Buddhists nor other practitioners uh, ever excluded their, uh, if you want to use a market model, they never excluded their competitors. Um, there was always room for another specialist, either in the village uh, or in the city. And finally, how do we conceive of all of the various supernatural agents engaged in the process of healing? From the Buddhist side, Buddhas and bodhisattvas, in effect, function like 
specialists, or in the U.S., when I, when my primary care physician needs to send me to someone specialist, he sends me to a specialist. I need special uh, permission, both from my doctor and from my insurance company. Uh, and that then I can go to see the specialist. I can go to see a, a ditang, a kshtigarba bodhisattva, who special, might specialize in helping us if we are stuck in hell. I can go to see Avalokiteshvara uh, if I need particular help uh, with uh, childbirth, um, and so on. So let me start near the beginning with relatively simple acts of healing. Um, the photo, photo you see uh, is, is courtesy of the British Library, uh, is a text I've, I've, I've worked on um, and will play a significant role in, uh, in the book I'm working on right now. Uh, as you can see, it's, a, uh, it's entitled, uh, I haven't translated the Chinese title, but it's a uh, uh, healing liturgies for monks or a monk. Um, and in fact, this, this text contains healing liturgies for a monk, a nun, a, uh, uh, an adult male, um, and, um, and a, an acharya, uh, a monk with a special title. Uh, we'll be reading parts of this in the seminar uh, tomorrow. Uh, so liturgical manuals are, are quite, um, uh, quite interesting. Uh, they're, they're, they're the current subject of my re research. They survive at Dunhuang. We have things like them from other parts of the Buddhist world, especially in Japan. We have ganmon and, and prayer texts uh, from Japan. Uh, but the ones from Dunhuang are, uh, survive in great numbers. Uh, this is an anthology. It was used by a monk uh, who, who served in a priestly capacity, performing many different kinds of rituals. So this is the the textual and, and world and the world of religious practice from which this material comes. It survives especially at Dunhuang, but because its material was so practical and so, uh, so, so much involved with the life of, of folks at the lower levels of society, uh, these materials have not survived in great number in the canon uh, nor in printed editions. So this makes the material from Dunhuang particularly valuable. So the standard healing ritual uh, in these texts, uh, a standard Huan Wan, or healing liturgy, uh, includes seven steps. I'll run through them very briefly uh, right now. First, the speaker, uh, the priest, praises the Buddha's virtue, then talks about the purpose of the ritual, to heal such and such a person using the transfer of merit. The patient or sufferer is described in generic terms and first lauded and then essentially told, you're sick, it's probably because of a deed you committed either in your previous lifetime or more recently. Uh, the acts that are performed in the ritual are discussed next under step four, offering of flowers, offering of incense, hanging of banners, Next comes what I consider to be the, the crux of the ritual, which is the transfer of merit. The text itself uses a, a fancier word. It uses the word ornamentation for that. Uh, but what's basically involved is a transfer of merit uh, known throughout the Buddhist world. One, a good deed has been performed. A donation has been made by the donor or sponsor of the ritual. That good deed creates, uh, creates goodness, creates merit. That merit in this step of the right is taken and then transferred to the beneficiary. That's the crucial part. That's the crucial step in the ritual. Then a prayer is uttered describing how the beneficiary should benefit from the donation and some closing words are said. We'll run through these seven steps in more detail. As I said in our text reading seminar tomorrow, uh, the language used in these seven sections, sections differs um, and, and is quite interesting from a, a linguistic and literary and performative. So some actual examples. Dunhuang also preserves, uh, written on the backs of other sheets of paper, uh, very simple, very humble 
uh, records of donations given for acts of healing, for the, for the commissioning of rituals of healing. Uh, Pelio 2583 in particular uh, is a now put together as a long scroll of, consisting of 14 sheets of paper. But each of those 14 sheets of paper started off as a simple record taking up only part of the piece, pa piece of paper, recording in detail, I'll show you one, recording in detail first what the donation is, the, the goods that are given, second, liturgical words, words that are close to those being spoken because they refer to, to things that are done in the ritual, third, a date, and fourth, an authentication by the receiving official. So the first part, as you can see, describes the, the relatively humble offerings made by a nun. We know her name. We know the date on which the donation was made. Secondly, uh, the liturgical portion of this record uh, says the aforementioned are for the nun, Ming Qian's illness. Her, her illness is described in generic terms. She has long been in bed on her pillow, waiting slowly without a cure. Now comes the ritual part. We undertake to donate these possessions in a ritual, and then their directions to perform the chanting. Please chant on our behalf. The date is given, uh, apparently written by the nun herself. I have my doubts about that, as most nuns at Dunhuang were not, uh, were not very literate. Um, and finally, the authentic authentication by uh, a, a named monk. Uh, and as you can see, it's, in a, it's, in, it's at least in a different brush. I think it's by a different hand as well. It's, his authentication is given uh, pr probably at a different place and and date different time from the writing up of the, the, the record of donation itself. So all of this is under sim relatively simple acts of healing, in this case, undertaking a donation. Other relatively simple acts of healing, ritual forms of healing, involve the copying of manuscripts. This is a benefit promised not only in texts that are focused on healing, but uh, throughout Mahayana Buddhist literature, uh, we find exhortations to copy Buddhist texts to enjoy the benefit and enjoy the karmic benefits thereof. This can take place in, in relation to healing. This can take place in relation to an individual practice. This can take place in relation to propagating a particular text. This can take place in, in relation to ensuring the well-being of one's ancestors. So there are a variety of uses to which this can be put, but the mechanism and the technology is the same. Either one copies oneself, part of a text or a text, or one pays to have one copied. The results are the same, largely the same. In terms of karmic benefits, they're largely the same. So we have such a, an example from uh, a Maitreya, text uh, illustrated in, at, in a Midtang cave at Yulin near Dunhuang. Uh, the man copying at bottom right uh, is depicted, and presumably in his next life, he will follow the, the, the path uh, to be reborn in Tush to heaven. Something uh, similar, uh, harder to see, but also quite interesting from the perspective of uh, medieval technologies of copying and, and, and the actual process of textual reproduction we see here. Uh, we, this is an illustration of a different text, the Bao Yu Jing, uh, and we see uh, one person reading aloud, holding the, the scroll in front of him, and uh, the person doing the actual copying, doing the performance of the writing uh, beside him, uh, writing it down. Uh, at, at, after the first recitation. So giving or donation, copying, and next we want to consider chanting. Uh, this illustration, uh, I'll show you the larger painting it's taken from in a moment. This is but one scene, one small panel in a, in a longer, uh, much larger uh, painting. Uh, this painting shows um, how 
chanting was thought to be done or how chanting was supposed to be done. In this case, uh, let's first talk about the painting and then we can run through the accompanying cartouche, which you see here. Uh, the painting shows an old man uh, supported by a family member uh, with two children, two young boys, reading along uh, and facing the viewer, uh, giving, letting us see who the real players are in this, uh, in this performance. Uh, the, the main performers are the two monks um, who are f f facing us directly and whose uh, sutra scrolls are, are really pretty big. I think it's a little bigger than, than most sutra scrolls were, really. Most sutra scrolls, most uh, tongue paper uh, was about, a sheet of paper was about one foot tall by about two feet wide. Uh, these are even bigger. In order to accentuate the importance of them, having a text that they can recite on behalf of a lay person. As the text says, as the cartouche says, and the cartouche is itself, a paraphrase of, of a canonical text on the, the medicine, uh, the, the healing Buddha, medicine master, uh, medicine master by Shoju Guru. Uh, if there are any sentient beings who get sick and have trouble getting better, those who lack medicine or doctors, or those who have no success in, and here we get a list of the other practices that the text expects you to have already performed. Petitioning the gods, asking a profane master to do so. Calling on shadowy phantoms, Wang Liang. Seeking fortunate blessings, desiring their years to be extended. If the sick wish to cast off the suffering of illnesses, what should they do? They should call the monks to perform rituals of chanting, or they should themselves engage in confession rituals dedicated to the Medicine Master by Shoju Guru Tathagata. This is the broader, uh, this is the, the full painting uh, from which this scene is taken. The scene is at top right. Um, as Professor Whitfield has shown in his, his study of this entire piece and the associated symbolism and design, uh, Medicine Master uh, by, by Shoju Guru is in the center, Sun and Moon Bodhisattvas on each side. Um, on the left, a panel narrating the Baishoja Guru's 12 vows, uh, enunciated in, in a couple versions of the text, and the nine forms of unfortunate death, uh, all the different ways that people could and did die, and from which you can be rescued uh, if you invoke, uh, if you invite monks uh, to chant sutras in the proper way. Uh, so one more uh, important point about chanting, we usually think of it as uh, hiring other people to chant for oneself. That's, that's what impression you would get if you think about the transfer of merit. But in fact, there are many uh, sources uh, that explain chanting uh, can not only be done on behalf of somebody else, but I can do it on behalf of myself, and I cannot simply create merit. I can transform myself through chanting into a, a, an agent of healing. Uh, this crops up in stories about healing contained in different forms of literature. We find it in uh, miracle tales about the Diamond Sutra. We find it in biographies of monks uh, and in plenty of other literature from the medieval period. Uh, this is important because it confirms what we, it confirms and fills out what we know from Dunhua uh, and shows that the phenomena involved are not simply uh, coming from Northwest China, but rather Northwest China connected as it was uh, strongly uh, to Central China, but, but equally uh, strongly and significantly at different periods to kingdoms further West and South. Uh, it, conf it shows us that that there's a much broader continuum in which these, these practices were pursued. So in this case, uh, there's a fabulous story. Uh, I think it's the most uh, illuminating one from, from the Ming Baoji, the Record of Unseen Retribution. This is a miracle, a collection of miracle tales uh, from the 
middle of the seventh century. Uh, I'll, let me summarize the story. It's too long to read, uh, and I've, I've just included the the uh, not the punchline, but the conclusion, uh, the salvific or or he, total to the, the healing, uh, the efficient conclusion of this text. Uh, there's a monk named Sung Chu uh, who uh, lived in the 6th, 7th century. Sung Chu uh, lived in the mountains. He eschewed, eschewed city life and had a temple, a small, very small temple built in, in a secluded area in the mountains. He loved the mountains. One day he was out walking. He ran across uh, a, a pitiable uh, man suffering from leprosy who had made a home for himself by digging a hole and making a kind of a, a hole, a hovel, uh, for himself in in the forest. Obviously, the man had been abandoned by by family and friend, uh, and uh, uh, was was quite moving. The monk uh, persuaded the man, after some back and forth, to come with him back to the temple, where he, the monk, uh, said, "I will take care of you." So his first act back at the temple was to make the the man suffering from leprosy feel at home. So he dug another pit for him on the grounds of the temple where he would feel secure and uh, safe and in the same kind of therapeutic environment that he had built for himself in isolation. Uh, and, uh, and then the monk set about trying to heal him. And his method was to teach him to chant. In this case, it's chanting the Lotus Sutra. But there's a wrinkle, of course. The man is portrayed as being very... Uh, first of all, uh, it's, it's pretty clear he can't read, so he's taught how to chant the, the Lotus Sutra uh, verbally from memory, as, as many, many folks did learn uh, the Lotus Sutra. Um, and, but he, he, it's really slow going, and so the monk grows very frustrated. Um, but finally, uh, a deity appears to the, to the patient in a dream, and the, and the deity takes over teaching the man how to recite the Lotus Sutra. Get, so he gets him to the very end of the Lotus Sutra. It's, it's eight, usually it's eight scrolls, literally eight chan in 28 chapters um, uh, in, in, in medieval China. Um, and that works. Um, it works so well that the man, uh, as he's nearing the end, he begins to recover. Uh, his skin uh, begins, to, uh, begins to return. Um, he puts on weight, um, and then we go to the next stage. So he not only cures himself through the intoning, through the uh, intoning of the text, but then he himself becomes a, a curative agent. He is sent by the monk, his teacher and curer, to go heal other people. So the conclusion uh, here, as you can see, reads, by the time that the man reached the fifth and sixth scrolls out of eight, he gradually felt his sores getting better. And when he could complete the chanting of the whole text, his hair and eyebrows had grown back, and he was corpulent again like normal. Moreover, he could cure illness on behalf of others. Like many miracle tales, this one ends with the authors or collectors uh, guarantee that he himself has seen has seen with his own eyes the results of this and not only that in this case it wasn't some authors curing once when i tong lin suffered from a tumor the monk sung cha assigned this man and his exorcistic spells resulted in a cure so i myself can say that this is true one further largely oral uh, form of, a uh, simple form of religious healing from the medieval period I want to talk about is confessing. Uh, confessing uh, is conf the ritualized confession as an action, of course, is, is central to Buddhism, uh, has always been in most places. Uh, think back to the Pratimoksha and the, rest the fortnightly recitation of the hundreds of infractions by monks and nuns. That basic setup uh, very early made its way into lay practice um, as well in, in many different Buddhist cultures. Um, 
the Dunhuang materials also contain not only liturgies for donation and turning that donation through the transfer of merit towards healing, they also contain liturgies that lay out a confession ritual. So curing with confession rather than curing with karma. The seven steps in those healing rituals are similar to the ones we just looked at, but two of them are, are, are different, and I want to just remark on them. The first part is the invocation of deities. So after praising the Buddha, uh, deities are invoked. That is, they are invited to come down to the ritual space, not to perform the healing per se, but to serve as witnesses, as divine witnesses to the acts of confession that are being that are about to be undertaken. Uh, the purpose of the ritual is a similar format. The patient is described in similar ways and then enters the confession. Um, and uh, I've given the beginning of, of, I've excerpted just the beginning of, of one particular text, which goes now in front of the pure assembly. That's the pure assembly is either the, the monks, if they're monks assembled, or it's the deities who have been invoked to attend. I confess and ask forgiveness for my past mistakes. There follows a generic listing of misdeeds, and it's generic in the sense that monks have a standard list they're supposed to go through. Nuns have a standard list they're supposed to go through. Laymen, laywomen, and so forth. To each social and religious station, there is a corresponding set of very generic, standardized misdeeds. So those are the words you speak, not what you in fact did yesterday or last year, but rather the deeds that cover all such acts that a person such as me might commit. And then that closes with, may all the valuables that I offer be accepted for making merit. So there's also uh, a donation and a transfer of merit combined with this confession. Those are relatively simple forms of healing, in my, my estimation. Uh, more complex forms uh, I'd like to talk about now. These are more complex in the sense that the technology is more involved, the actions often take longer, uh, and there are specialists and often uh, esoteric forms of knowledge. That is knowledge that is not publicly accessible, but is in, contained in, in, in secret manuals or in, in secret words. Uh, so complex healing, uh, the lighting of lamps. Um, there were lamp lighting ceremonies uh, all across China, both before Buddhism and after Buddhism. Uh, this is, uh, this, uh, what you see here is, is a, an, a depiction of perhaps one of the most fantastic imaginations of how that lamp lighting ceremony was performed. This is uh, Mogul Cave 220, uh, redone by the Jai family in the year 642. Um, this is uh, the eastern wall. Um, uh, this is the eastern wall, and this is the, the opposite wall. This is the connecting wall. This is another connecting wall. So we're, we're standing with our backs to the west looking east, and this is what we see from floor to ceiling. It's a scene of uh, the seven Buddhas outlined in the uh, Baishaja Guru Sutras. Uh, they each have canopies over them. They're accompanied by yakshas and various followers. So this is uh, the eastern pure land on the western side behind us is a is a mirror pure land uh, and that's the the western pure land of Amitayas. Uh, I want to draw your attention to what's going on down here uh, with what these bodhisattvas are doing. There is um, a, a tree here, a, a, a tree here. Uh, these are uh, trees, uh, lamp trees, trees that hold candles, uh, probably uh, uh, oil lamps in them. And this thing in the middle, I'll show you a close up in a second, is a multi tiered uh, lamp tower. Uh, so
let's take these two bodhisattvas working so carefully on this lamp tree. Uh, many individual pots of oil, uh, probably with wicks that are burning. And to keep this many lamps going at one time, it's not easy. It takes two people, right? You have one bodhisattva uh, pouring oil into cups uh, to be handed up. Uh, and we have the other bodhisattva attending to each individual flame as it needs to be sustained. So it's a complex process. The Baishoja Guru Sutra, as well as many earlier sutras, such as the Consecration Sutra, uh, uh, indigenous Chinese Buddhist creation, uh, all uh, associate practices of healing with lighting lamps in seven tiers and keeping them lit for seven times seven days, for 49 days. Other relatively complex forms of healing involve sealing or the wearing of talismans. Uh, so, the, so the basic idea here in both of these practices, both sealing and writing of talismans, is that one takes the power that originally derives from a Buddha or Bodhisattva and transfers that power first into some kind of meaning-bearing form like writing or sound, and then uses that to attach to the person, to affect the person through the senses in some way. So for, uh, let's take the example here. Um, this is a, a long manual uh, containing many talismans uh, from Dunhuang, Stein 2498. It contains the original talisman. It contains a more standardized uh, interpretation of these talismans uh, in, in a form that looks, looks like a Chinese character. Um, this character uh, pre-exists Buddhism. If you look at Han Dynasty um, uh, talis talismans that have been unearthed in archaeological remains outside of Buddhism, we find this exact uh, uh, character and there are reasons having to do with the semantic pieces of the character for, for why it's used for childbirth, but it's consistent. Taoist manuals for talismanic making used for childbirth have this same, same talisman. But this is put to Buddhist use. It's contained in a, in a Buddhist text. It's contained in a text that has Dharanis uh, and that has other kinds of rituals in it. But here is for talismans. Um, uh, I've translated just the first two columns, uh, first two sections of text here and here. Um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna read it in detail, it's, it's there. Uh, let me simply summarize them. In the first case, one writes out the talisman, and it's one, this is not everybody who can write it out. This, these are handbooks kept by ritual specialists. So the specialist writes out the talisman and then probably burns it. Uh, that was the common practice. And then gives it to the patient to swallow. Uh, probably, uh, sometimes this is done in, in a simple tea, in a simple broth. Sometimes it's done in a more complex uh, substance involving, involving vinegar and peach seeds, which also have healing properties. So we find a mix of both uh, talismanic practice and uh, herbal practice in the same practice. Uh, second example, uh, similarly, one uh, swallows it, but then uh, one can also uh, chant over uh, water to enchant the water uh, and then administer the water to the person. That's yet another way to transfer the power that originally derives uh, from the Buddha, a Buddha, uh, to a patient. It has to cross media and it has to do so through some kind of meaningful representation, whether it's a dadani in the form of sound or a written dadani or even uh, these squiggles, uh, which are fairly comprehensible and there are ones that are much less comprehensible, but which are supposed to have their own semantic, uh, their own uh, semiotic meaning. Uh, 
another way to transfer the power, uh, once taken, translated uh, accurately from the healing power of the Buddha to a written representation, is to roll up that written representation and place it next to the body. Uh, and that is a way to transfer through contact or through proximity uh, the, the patient. And in this case, there's a, a beautiful example. I, I saw it, I uh, studied it in, in 2011, the last time I was in the British Library. Uh, this is a piece of paper. It's, it's, it's about three feet long, and it's about one inch tall. Uh, and, and what's the content? The content is a healing liturgy. Uh, right now, it's folded up. Uh, but I suspect it was done in this format so that it could be rolled up and either put in a satchel and kept close to the body. And we know from archaeological remains, um, uh, this one uncovered pretty recently uh, in the, from a tomb in the early Tang Dynasty, uh, that, that uh, corpses were buried, people were buried with uh, uh, a copper, coppered boxes that held Dharani or similar talismans. So that's another way to transfer the power. Finally, uh, perhaps the most complicated, let's just say another complicated technique, um, is exorcism. This gets back to an idea well known across uh, uh, the Buddhist world, uh, extending back into uh, Indian religion of all types and, and, and known uh, across across the world, ultimately. Um, but let's look at the particular Buddhist examples. The basic idea is that uh, the, uh, there are good gods and bad gods, and they can all be brought to the service of the, of the Buddha, and they can all be brought to the, into the service for the protection and apotropaic protection of followers of the Buddha. In particular, there is a class of demons that afflict children. Um, these, uh, give, given that childbirth and death of children, childbirth of, of, of the mother and death of young children were, were probably the most frequent forms of, of, of death, of mortality, uh, it's not surprising that this kind of practice would be so widespread. Uh, the uh, originals I have not seen in person yet, in the British Museum, uh, but they're really, uh, uh, really interesting set. Originally, there were a set of 16. I think uh, three slips survive, which with one deity on each side, so a total of six survive. The basic idea um, is that um, there are demons who can afflict uh, ch children. Uh, they do so by uh, stealing their soul or possessing them, and then that manifests in various forms of sickness. The way to figure this out is to um, perform a divination with the mother. In this case, it's a dream divination. You, you run through the dreams that the mother has had until you get to one of the animals mentioned in the 16, and if so, then we know the name of the demon. Knowing the name of the demon, we can then control the demon and offer sacrifice to the demon. But all of this requires, first, divination. Second, talking to the specialist who knows the, the system that associates the dream symbol with the appropriate demon, and then can administer the proper form for sacrifice. And ultimately, that is a way of exorcising, of drawing the spirit, the evil spirit, out of the child and making the child well. This ha occurs also for, uh, for deer, uh, the other uh, six that survive in, in the British Museum are, other, are the, the six are an ox, a stag, uh, a cat, a bird, a rooster, an owl. So let's, let's look at the whole process now. How is the process of healing conducted? How is it thought to work? Well, first of all, unlike modern biomedicine, there was always admitted that there could be a variety of causes of illness. 
So you see here in a uh, painting of the Ten Kings uh, from the 10th century, uh, painting of the Ten Kings and, and Kshtigarbha, uh, Bodhisattva, uh, Dizang and the Ten Kings. Uh, we see a scene uh, in the painting uh, which shows uh, this wonderful contraption on the right, um, which is the mirror of karma. Uh, we see a, poor, a deceased person uh, who is passing through the ten courts of purgatory, being judged in each one en route to rebirth for the next lifetime, uh, held in, in medieval Chinese handcuffs, um, the, the kang, uh, deriving that, that word, I think, comes from the Portuguese. Uh, uh, there's a, there are different words for it in Chinese. Um, so a, a poor sufferer, not, not in a very powerful position, being dragged before the, the judge, judges of purgatory en route to his next rebirth. And if he should attempt to lie and to say, it wasn't me or I didn't do that, he is taken in front of the karma mirror. And here he's shown, in fact, doing the bad deed slaying an ox in his previous lifetime. So there's no way to escape the rigors of the underworld bureaucracy. So that may be one reason why I'm sick today. Deeds from a previous lifetime. But the liturgical materials and, and a wide range of Chinese Buddhist materials on healing also allow for other causalities. Uh, they allow for the disequilibrium of yin and yang um, on the one side from China. On the other side, they allow for the imbalance of the four elements, a traditional uh, idea of, of Indian physiology. Uh, they allow for my sickness now is caused by my enemy uh, who may have uh, put a curse on me or who may have uh, used magic to make me sick or I'm being possessed by demons, uh, either from my own, my own uh, uh, difficulties right now make me susceptible to demons, or because um, they have been sent by someone else. So all of these causes of illness are possible, and they all, uh, they all are open to multiple forms of cure. Uh, how about calling on divine assistance. Um, I, I was really intrigued when I started this project because many of the deities, most of the deities invoked in, in Buddhist healing liturgies are not the major, the primary care bodhisattva, by Guru Bodhisattva, or the healing Buddha, whose name is master of medicine. Right? Uh, he is involved in some, but he's, he's more often not involved. So, who is involved? A whole range of deities, and they range from high Buddhas to medium bodhisattvas and lower gods to uh, including uh, gods who have only a tenuous commitment to Buddhist dharma, gods, nagas, and deities. And they also include the recurring form, the, the return form and as a reincarnation of the Buddha's own physician. Uh, whom the Buddha shared, uh, who was uh, uh, sent to the Buddha by one of the kings uh, whom the Buddha preached to, that's Jivaka, also shows up as a, a deity invoked in medieval Chinese Buddhist healing liturgies. So the process relies on divine assistance from a really wide range of figures. Uh, how does the process work? Well, I've been looking at the language of liturgical materials, and this language uh, the, 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 the words spoken are filled with very highly condensed allusions and metaphors, some of which uh, are great, potent in the sense of, of powerful, uh, compressed uh, notions of healing and well-being. Uh, so just to re uh, re read, read, let's read just the first example from a liturgy. This is in the prayer part. So once the merit has been transferred to the beneficiary, what's, what's the wish, uh, the Yuan one, uh, for this particular uh, person who is sick? 
may the crown of his head be anointed with ghee and the rain of the Dharma enrich his body. May 10,000 fortunes gather like clouds and the thousand calamities roll away like fog. So the, the process is conveyed not simply by saying he'll, he'll get better and, and, uh, and won't get sick again. It's, it's conveyed through processes that are carried out perhaps by deities, perhaps in an imaginary space, perhaps with substances that we can't all see right now. But they're really luscious kinds of figures. Anoint, uh, shampooing with clarified butter. Enriching the body with a, a fertile, warm rain. These are pretty potent images, and there are plenty of other metaphors. I, I, I started to compile a list here and stopped. These are drawn just from this section of the liturgy, the various liturgies for healing. Uh, remember our sixth century informant, Gao Zushan, who said, first go to a doctor, people first go to a doctor, or they go to a Taoist, or they go to an exorcist, or they go to a Buddhist priest. Uh, we find throughout, uh, throughout the literature uh, that many therapies are considered. Few are ruled out in theory. The question is, are they effective? So here we see uh, these are illustrations of the Baishaja Guru Sutra uh, from Dunhuang. Um, uh, and they're examples of people pursuing other forms of healing that are, that are not specifically Buddhist. And some of them seem to be OK. Here's a poor man lying on his back and being fed with a long spoon. Uh, but this guy, this is the one of the nine forms of unfortunate death, is you take, you take medicine and it kills you. But of course, the other forms that can be practiced, this, uh, my, my anthropologist friends disagree with me, but, uh, and, and, but I found something like this illustration uh, in four or five places, uh, illustrations of what is secular exorcistic healing supposed to be like? What does it look like uh, in, in the uh, murals illustrating the Baishaja Guru Sutra? And it shows, um, it shows this, this, this group, uh, perhaps a female, perhaps a woman, shamaness, and accompanied by a singer um, to heal this person. But the best methods, of course, are Buddhist, and those are the ones displayed with most sumptuousness. So the ideal form for therapy is sponsor a Buddhist ritual, a Buddhist feast. And the, the ideal form of that, of course, is for the Buddha and his monks. Uh, so we'll do the second best, and we'll make it for the local monks. But you see uh, the monks, you see people preparing the meal, you see banners, which are always supposed to be involved in healing rituals, and you see a seven-tiered uh, lamp here as well. So let's come back to London. Um, Curzon Street. 1920s was when this uh, church, uh, only the facade remains, was, um, was first, was, was built. Um, healing is but one part of a broader process. And if we were looking in detail at the, uh, at the inscription, uh, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead. They, they uh, edited, of course, they're choosing here from the book of Matthew. Um, uh, they left, it cast out, left out, cast out the devils. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the same understanding of sickness, death, disease, uh, and some kind of uh, either resuscitation or ultimate rebirth, uh, ultimate salvation, is, uh, is also part of the Buddhist world. 
and I think uh, one really nice example with which I'll end um, in the Chinese Buddhist world for making that point um, is the depiction of what happens in the Pure Land. So if curing is simply the first step in the process, we would next think perhaps rebirth in the Pure Land is the final step. But it's not. It's the penultimate step. Right? Curing, and, and the, litur the liturgies, uh, some of the liturgies we'll be reading bear this out, they narrate a, a journey. And it begins uh, with curing of illness. It can extend to uh, all beings. Um, and then the next step is rebirth in the Pure Land here with Amitabha in the center, Bodhisattvas, Mahasthama, Prabhupada, Avalokiteshvara on each side, uh, musicians, uh, dancers, more Bodhisattvas, ornate, uh, lovely, three, four-tiered architecture, and a pool here. And it's this pool I want to look at. I want to look at some of the, uh, the lotus uh, buds in that pool uh, because they picture a being who is being born into the Pure Land. So you might think of this as a baby, but if we're lucky enough to be reborn in the Pure Land, this is exactly how we are reborn. This is a person being reborn into the Pure Land, and this person enjoys several benefits that we don't. So we, in the Buddhist view, in the Buddhist view, birth is, birth is impure. So the Buddha had a pure birth. He was born from his mother's side magically. This human being, this being, I, I, don't, I don't know if he's mostly human, not fully human, but mostly human, uh, when he's reborn in, in the pure land, he also is born not through the usual impure method, but he is reborn in a flower where he has gestated for a number of years. But that's not the end of the story. And the liturgies make clear. First, cure the illness to achieve longevity, that those benefits can be shared with others, family, ruler, all sentient beings. Purify body, mind, and speech to prepare for death. That allows one to achieve this condition, being reborn in the pure land. And once there, our liturgies continue. One is supposed to hear the Buddha preach, and with one's own ears hearing directly from the mouth of the Buddha, one will achieve final enlightenment. That is the ultimate cure. I'm going to stop here, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. interesting, very rich and insightful uh, lecture. I think the, especially the visual material is uh, uh, very telling of uh, many stories, actually. I think maybe I should forgo my usual privilege of the chair and open up to the uh, public. I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Um, so, or should I take my privilege of the chair? Maybe I shall, do, shall ask one, one, um, one question. The cost of healing. Mm -hmm. uh, you were talking about donations, mm -hmm. and um, um, that it made me think that uh, uh, that is a very important part of the process as well. Um, there is no healing without paying for it, or is there? Uh, the, their payment is always required, mm -hmm. but payment is can take different forms and and can. Uh, Often we can, often our sources revert to the Buddhist, the importance in Buddhism of intention. So if right. the intention is pure, even the smallest act of giving uh, makes a difference. But it has to be a pure intention. Uh, the, the, the least costly act of healing I've seen thus far uh, involving a donation to the Sangha is the nun's example that I showed uh, and out of those 14 different liturgies, uh, 12 of them were donations by nuns, and it was clearly it was their, their old clothing, uh, a couple pieces of their old clothing. 
Um, I, I am compiling a list based on um, uh, uh, Dunhuang materials uh, because we have about a hundred different records of donation for specific acts of, of, of healing and especially funerals. And yeah. of course, and, uh, which of course funerals are the biggest business yeah. uh, and the biggest concern, uh, funerals and memorial rights, uh, but healing comes second after that if we look at the numbers of, of liturgies that survive. Um, and so th there are some records and they range from the quite humble to the quite ornate. Uh, have from either from the local ruler or from non Dunhuang sources, we know emperors often for their yes. wives or empresses uh, constructed a new monastery and endowed it and made sure that monks were there uh, round the clock uh, to chant and perform rituals on behalf of their wives or their mothers. So it's it's a big range. It was a very adaptable. Yeah, yeah. very common in so many. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, they all follow that seven. So uh, the ones, I, the the liturgical handbooks I'm looking at uh, use a, a fairly common in the sense that it's shared across them. They use seven steps in the ritual, but for the funerary ritual, uh, in in place of praising the beneficiary, you would praise the deceased person according to their station in life, and uh, other than that. They're very similar, and the reason is they're both oriented towards that ultimate or towards that last step. And so you can include healing now in, in that step. That's just the step prior to when healing fails, then we add the memorial part. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, they, are very, they are very similar. Now, this is not to say that a funeral is the same thing as a curing event. These are, are, are still, um, these are rituals performed by Buddhist monks. They're, they're not at graveside, so they're different. Uh, the monks tended not to get involved uh, with anything directly involved with the corpse, for instance. That was somebody else. That was another religious specialist, and, and we have evidence of that already from the medieval period. It's very common in China and, and other parts of Asia now that those du duties are divided they're corpse specialists who are considered to be polluted and have other kinds of specialist knowledge or geomancers. Uh, and then there are people who take care of the, the memorial part. Yeah. Yes. It's also related to um, the way we interpret Southeast Asia and, and the African, African material. Mm -hmm. Just when you say it like the, the lighting ceremony, mm -hmm. for example, you have the seven rays of um, candles, mm -hmm. if you like, um, or 49 is also in the 19th century mm -hmm. idea that you describe it too. Mm -hmm. So if there is that kind of parallel and when we interpret the visual image, um, can it be also um, be, can be interpreted in relation to it's a memorial, uh, uh, yeah, it's a memorial exactly. right? Uh, it, it could be, except for, uh, I mean, so, so, so the, number, the number seven has a lot to do with transition in general. Uh, I, uh, and this is not my original claim. This, not, this claim is not original to me. Um, so uh, the Buddha's uh, uh, meditations uh, are often thought to have proceeded through uh, uh, seven times seven. Um, the world over. Uh, transition uh, is often bound up with a number seven. The Vaishaja Guru text in particular says for healing rituals use seven times seven. Um, but it's clearly it's uh, it's involved with both with death and with healing um, and um, um, they're both they both involve very big transitions. Right? Mm. There are questions there? Professor Whitfield? Uh, I 
think I was very taken uh, when you um, identified the scene of exorcism in Cave 148 um, uh, to relate the figure dancing with a pipa, um, mm. providing music and, and dance, which of course are also acceptable offerings. Um, if we turn to the silk painting in the British Museum with uh, the 12 vows on one side on the Buddha's right and uh, the nine forms of violent death on, on the other. Uh, there is, we wait until it comes on the screen. It's quite a way back. There we are. Yes, so uh, you showed us the scene that circled in the upper right there, but immediately above that is a female figure mm. dancing uh, with a pipa. Um, mm. uh, she uh, is uh, dancing and in front of her is a canopy hanging from a tree mm. uh, and beneath that canopy on the ground are two slabs, placed, one smaller than the other, like paving stones uh, placed uh, to form a kind of mandala or uh, altar. Uh, so I think this would be relevant to your, uh, uh, your study. Thank you. Wonder that's 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 extremely helpful. Uh, I've already built. Uh, I came into this material through through your uh, thorough study of it. What do you think she's doing? What what kind of figure do you think she is in these among these well, specialists? Well, I've never had a satisfactory because uh, answer to that because uh, the other scenes that are below this uh, all show the various uh, unfortunate circumstances in which one might come to grief, being pushed off a cliff or falling into a lake or uh, into a fire. Uh, or hunting is uh, mm. one uh, uh, mm. where accidents can easily happen, I suppose, but anyway, there's, there's a hunter uh, there. So this is, uh, these are the, the circumstances. So above that, obviously, this female figure dancing and playing music is not, uh, well, I suppose you could interpret it as um, uh, as being um, uh, it, uh, excessive indulgence in, in these, but I think that it is a, a ritual, a, some kind mm -hmm. of um, yeah. uh, a ritual. So that's, uh, by the way, uh, I think you should cross, can cross off 10th century. It's a definitely 9th century or possibly Great. even earlier. Great. Um, in date. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you very much for the wonderful lecture, uh, Professor Tizer. Um, you uh, listed as first as a simple healing method, copying sutra. I can give you one of the uh, quite interesting and excellent example from Korea. Um, in the 15th century, Joseon King, Sonjo, had a terrible disease of his eye, eye disease. Mm. So it was very difficult to cure, but he was a devout Buddhist, Buddhist monarch. And he asked his courtiers to bring the most expensive material for writing sutra. Um, uh, that is the Sutra of, uh, no, uh, that is a Dharani of complete overcome of eye disease. So it is now in Fukuoka, and I think it is uh, one of a very good actual examples. So copying Sutra is one of the methods mm. of healing. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. I look forward to, to finding the, the piece itself. I'll ask you later. Thank you. Vivian Pierre. Vivian Lowe. Hi, thank you very much. Um, 
I'm just wondering whether you see any evidence of the tension between um, monks' um, freedom to t treat other monks in the Sangha and between treating the laity in any of the evidence that you've looked at. That's, that's an important question, and behind it, if for those of you who don't know, uh, Dr. Law is asking, uh, is ref referring to the frequent prohibition uh, by almost all official sources for monks to practice healing among the laity. Um, and this is uh, all across the Buddhist world, the Vinayas, all, all surviving Vinayas maintain this prohibition and prohibition on fortune telling, on healing, on exercising, on child, on assisting with, on for, for serving as nuns, cannot serve as midwives. Uh, but the state agrees as well. And so in secular law in China, there's the same prohibition. And um, the answer is not really. That is, do I see evidence among the Dunhuang materials? And the answer is not really. So why do I hedge a little bit? I hedge because there are many cases of monks performing these kinds of simple healing rituals for other monks. But there are also many examples of, of monks writing liturgies that they performed to heal lay people. But there, there are a lot more, there, I, there, there are more lay roles than there are monk roles in the surviving corpus. Um, but there are a lot of, of surviving liturgies specifically for monks and nuns as well. But I, other than that, I don't see, I don't see any, any difficulty, no, uh, no reflection of those interdictions and no, no indication of that conflict. I wonder how did monks take over the role of healers in the first place, and how did they come come up quite high in the hierarchy of healers? Thank you. Uh, thank you. This uh, this is a this is an important question uh, that the Dunhuang materials actually take us some distance toward answering, uh, because most monks did not perform rituals like this. Those monks who performed rituals in general for the laity uh, at Dunhuang were a relative minority uh, and were probably senior. And I, this is, I say this based not on the research that I've done, but drawing on the conclusions. Some of it statistically backed up and, and by uh, my colleague Hao Chunwen, Professor Hao of, of Shoshida, of Capital Normal University, and his first book uh, on the social life of Buddhist monks and nuns at Dunhuang. Um, and he has uh, a very nice description of of and, and calculation of how much how much was paid for certain kinds of rituals, who were the monks who performed them uh, in relation to other monks, and as, and so on. Professor Stephen, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I come from China. Um, I am a, a visiting scholar, uh, just come here. Uh, because my English is very poor, my I speak in Chinese? Uh, you you <laughs> Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Because my English is very 比起我们中国内地的那个学者的研究还有棒还有道教的一个治疗那么在中国传统民众当中道教的治疗和佛教的治疗这两者民众他更倾向于哪一种 
，这是第一个问题。第二个问题呢，我听到您说，呃，佛教的治疗当中有这个服食护身符，护身符，啊，但是据我所知，护身符的一种服食，一种就是服食，更多的是道教的治疗方式，而不是佛教的治疗方式。所以我在想，呃，我不知道你是从哪里得到了这个资料。OK， 这那我我我把你的问题呃、uh, 说一个总结，谢谢谢谢，不好意思啊。啊、uh, ，So uh the visiting professor uh asked uh uh what was the mix of Buddhist, Taoist, and folk elements uh or popular elements uh in this material, and he he was under the impression that uh practices of nourishing life. Uh, if I understood him correctly, were particularly pronounced in Taoism.、Um, I'll give one short answer. Uh, uh, and that uh, uh, and that is that uh, uh, the there is a lot of evidence from Dunhuang、uh, that shows that that the lines between、uh, folk practice or Uh, local exorcistic practice and local healers and local doctors on the one hand, and monks on the other hand. That that was a they were they were doing very similar things and providing versions of rituals、uh, without much conflict between them,、uh, and that they were working on behalf of a populace that did not draw very strict lines.、Um, uh, There's much less evidence at Dunhuang about Taoism, but that largely has to do with the particularities of the history of Taoism at Dunhuang in, in far west China,、uh, because Dunhuang、um, uh, was uh, once uh, once the Anlu Shan Rebellion happened in the middle of the eighth century,、uh, and the the central state was weakened. The Taoist presence at, at Dunhuang declined rapidly. Uh, abetted by the fact that a very powerful、uh, Tibetan military、uh, regime ruled、uh, Dunhuang for the next 80 years, and so that really rang a death knell for the Taoist establishments.、Uh, so it's just very hard to make a comparison. And then after that, Taoist、uh, Dao、uh, institutional life was very slow to regrow、uh, in the period of independent rule from from the eight, eight thirties onward.、Uh, 中中文简单的说法就是，佛教的佛教徒跟所谓呃民间宗教的呃习惯真的不太远，呃，常常有有来往。I have to put an end、yeah. to the discussion. I'm sorry for this, but we have to leave、uh, the room. However, we have a reception just outside here, so I invite you all to stay and uh, uh, ask more questions in a more informal way. I'm sure、um, there will be another uh, uh, good time to to talk more, to、uh, get more of uh, uh, Professor Tizer's knowledge. But uh, uh, for now, let us thank him for a wonderful contribution. Thank you.